Actually, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce our distinguished first keynote speaker, Professor Charles Graham. And uh, I gave him yesterday an introduction of two pages. And I said, would you look at that introduction and, and just if you want to add something to it, because that's the minimum length who can, uh, which can be used to present him. And he returned only short paragraph. So I'm going to share that paragraph with you. Uh, Charles Graham is a department chair and professor of instructional psychology and technology at Brigham Young University, which is located in Utah in the United States of America. He has authored numerous articles and books related to blended teaching and learning. He's excited to visit the UAEU again after eight months and after being a proud grandfather for the second time during those eight months. And he looks forward to the conversations he will have with all of you over the next two days. And actually, he started yesterday full day of discussions and conversations with faculty fellows and BTL community of practice. His keynote speech is titled, and that is a timely title actually, Developing Faculty Disposition and Competencies for Effective Blended Teaching which is exactly what we need at this stage. When you sit here and you ask yourself, what kind of competencies should I have in order to work on my course? Well, I think this question is gonna be answered today and he will be around to, uh, 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 to, to extend that with you. And actually after lunch, he will go through a workshop about scholarship of teaching and learning and, and, and the workshop actually is, a, is about blended teaching and learning and its relevant scholarship of teaching and learning. Without any further ado, the floor is yours, sir. This is the university that I come from, but since I was here last, you know, what we're all about, right, is family and, you know, we, we teach at the university, but uh, uh, we do it so that we can support family and live with family and this uh, since I was here last, I had two grandchildren born, my first two grandchildren, so I'm very excited and happy about that. They're born two months apart, and that's why I do this. That's why I teach and, and have a job like this so that I can have a uh, family. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Uh, this is the university that I'm at, Brigham Young University, where I come from. You can see it's right at the base of the mountains. And so uh, uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, my uh, academic background, Hassan talked about a little bit. Uh, these are some, this is some of the research that I've done related to blended teaching and, and learning. And I hope to share some of the most recent research that I have been doing with you about competencies and dispositions related to, to blended teaching. So last time when I came, I talked about course redesign. And that's oftentimes what we talk about when we talk about blended learning. We talk about what you need to do to transform or re, uh, recreate your course in a blended format. Today, I want to talk about uh, blended teaching. So just transforming your course is only part of the picture, right? That's like having the materials, having the syllabus, having the textbook, having the online materials. But we know that a course doesn't stand alone with, with just the materials. It requires someone to, to teach it and to teach effectively. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Is, is the blended teaching side of the mix. Um, I will make these links available to you. Uh, they're passing out a, a sheet that has the links on it. Um, after this presentation, you'll be able to get into this, into here, and there's a link to the resources from last year, too. If you missed that and want to go in and look at the design side of things, you can, you can get those. So I want to begin with this question. What do you feel the top two skills are that you need to have to be an effective blended teacher? So 
So I'm just going to give you a couple minutes. If you're in a spot where you're not by someone, turn around, talk to the person behind you, talk to the person next to you. I want you to share with, the, with them what you think the top two skills are that you need to be an effective blended teacher. All right, you guys connect here. You guys connect, you need to be talking. Oh, you'll talk with Tendai? Okay. Yes? Oh, yeah. The top two skills that you need. Okay, take about 30 more seconds, and then we'll get some of you to, to report back. Top two skills for blended teaching. Okay, let's hear from a couple of, pe uh, couple of people. Raise your hand if you think you have a skill that you think is, is really important. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Other thoughts? Yes, right here. Let's get the microphone so people can hear you. We're talking about the skills here. I think the first skills is to, to um, be able to identify what you need to blend in your course in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have this, the, the skill to be able to know what to blend. Okay, good. Let's have a couple more. Okay, right, right here and in the back. So, we, microphone, raise your hand so that. Uh, we had just talked about um, needing to have excellent communication skills. So, being able to co communicate the that to your students as well as to be flexible, to have flexibility in, in your course Good. And, and the way you approach things. Good communication skills. Not only communicate with the instructional designer that's helping you, right, but also with uh, the students. Good. I think you need to have the technology know-how on how to use different items, different apps, different technology to help you add to what you know in terms of knowledge of the content and then blend that with it. Great. So there's, a, there's some technical skills that are required to be able to do that too, right? You need to have, if you don't have some technical skills, it's gonna be hard to build a blended course. So, um, I know that this screen is hard to see over here, but we did, we did a literature review looking at all of the competencies that, that are published right now related to blended teaching to try and understand what the skill sets are that are needed. Because we're interested in creating a blended teaching readiness instrument. Something that would help you know what skills you have and what deficiencies you have so you can, so, so you can build the skills that you need. And what we found was that in the majority of the competencies, we, we, when we looked at the competencies, we coded them to see if they were kind of generic competencies, if there are competencies that were unique to a blended environment, or if there are competencies that were for uh, online teaching competencies. And the interesting thing that we found was that in all the comp, we, we coded over, I think, almost 600 different competency statements. And what we found was that the vast majority of them, vast majority of them were generic competencies. They said things like, 
uh, openly and frequently sh share, share successes, failures, and challenges. Active listening. So as we started to look at that, it was kind of, it, it, it was a little bit frustrating to us because we're trying to, I'm trying to create professional development in my own institution and uh, I teach in a school of education. We're preparing our K-12 teachers to also teach blended in their schools because in the United States, in the K-12 environment, there's a lot of blending that's happening too. So our, our teachers that we're preparing to go out to the schools need to know how to do blended teaching also. And so if you have a generic competency that says um, you need to be uh, good at reflective practice, what, the te what our students say is, oh, well, I'm already good at that. And it doesn't tell them how to do it in a blended context, right? And so we looked at all of the competencies and we tried to pull out the ones that were most salient and relevant to uh, a blended context because blended teachers have to have all the skills for being effective in a face-to-face -face setting plus the skills for being effective in, a, in an online setting. So the, we came up with four core competencies that I'm going to talk about today. These aren't the only competencies that are required for blended teaching, but these are four very, very important ones. I have them listed right here. We also built a visual of a building with the pillars as the competencies. I'm going to talk about each one of those fours. And the foundation also is important here. So the foundation is dispositions and technical or technology skills, like was mentioned in, in the back. And uh, then there's four pillars. You can think of them as pillars on a building that hold that building of blended teaching up, or you can think of, about them as a puzzle. And those skills are online integration. I'll talk about that more in depth, but it's related to the comment that was made here. Understanding how to connect the online and blended portion of the course. The second one is what we say, what we call data practices. And um, I'll talk about that further too. Then we have personalization, and the last one is online, uh, online uh, interaction or communication. So teaching dispositions. This is the foundational piece of the building. This is what you need to start with to build the other skills. So these are the core, I don't know why this is, is it feels like it's scratching or something. Is that me? Oh, this, let me take that off. Rubbing on the microphone. Okay, so there's four dispositions that we found that were important to blended teaching. So the first is what we call student ownership and agency. So it's a disposition that says you need to believe that you can shift some of the responsibility to students to make decisions about their learning. And that it's not all about just hand-holding the students through the process. This is an important disposition in a blended learning context. The second is the value of data-driven decision making. So uh, important to uh, to uh, being able to do blended is that you believe that data can help you make important decisions that will improve the, the teaching and learning process. Fourth is what we call growth orientation. So it requires taking some risks sometimes, right? Because you're trying something new and that something new doesn't always work. Anybody who's blended in this, in this, in this uh, room will know that some things that they tried didn't work the way they hoped they would. But you have to have a you have to have a growth mindset, right? A growth disposition that it's okay to fail. You go fix the failure and you move forward and eventually you'll be you'll be successful. And the last is that you need to value the online learning uh, that online learning has something 
important to provide to the learning experience for your students. In terms of technical skills, we identified five core technical skills. You need to have a basic technical literacy, right? Ability to learn new technologies, willingness to try to learn new technologies. Digital citizenship, so you need to have some awareness of privacy issues. That's a, becoming a big issue at universities, being able to keep data, um, maintain the privacy of our students, as well as issues like academic honesty, legal use of materials, copyright, and fair use. The third technical skill is learning management systems. You need to be able to use the basic skills, the basic tools within the learning management system. If you can't do that, you guys have adopted Blackboard here. If you can't use the basic features of Blackboard, it's going to be very difficult to build a course and to interact within that course. And then uh, media creation tools, several of the, uh, several of the, um, Blackboardians that were highlighted, uh, uh, what do you call them, the, 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 the community of practice, yeah. the people who are here, what did, what was the name that you called them? Uh, Blackboardians. Blackboardians? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Th those, many of them mentioned that they used media creation skills, right? They were creating videos, they were creating animations, so those are some important skills for th the development of your course. Doesn't mean you need to be an expert, but once again, you need to be willing to try, right, and learn. And then the last thing is being able to use communication tools. So these are kind of the foundational skills. I, um, uh, wow, that just went, that just went through like 5,000 pages. I'm going to put a URL up here, and I want you to, if you have a computer or a cell phone, I want you to go in to this URL. What I've done is I've, cre I've created a blended teaching readiness survey, and you're going to be able to do a little self-evaluation for, for yourself, see where you are in these first two areas. So it's bit.ly slash UAEU dash BTR. BTR is for blended teaching readiness. Okay, and the capitalizations matter here. When you go in, I want you to only check the top two boxes because we're going to do these other one, these other skills as we go on. You're going to test yourself with the other skills. But go ahead and go in and uh, do that. I'll model it for you here while you're. Has, every, has everybody gotten the URL? The URL's on the handout, too. Yes, it's going to look like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up. Um, so it's going to come to a, a, a survey that looks like this. It's going to have those four things at the top. And you're going to check these two boxes. And once you've checked those boxes, you'll have a couple of questions down below. If you don't have a device, you can just look up here. But I hope you have a device, because you, you'll be able to uh, kind of see, do a self-evaluation. Remember, do that, do what? Yes. UAEU dash BTR, all caps. So there's 16 questions here, eight for the dispositions and eight for the technology skills. I want you to go through and answer those quickly and be honest with yourself because this is going to help you know what things you need to, uh, what areas you have that you can work on. Remember, one of the dispositions is a growth mindset, right? 
the knowledge that you're not perfect at something, but you're moving towards uh, improvement. How many have, have been able to complete so far? Raise your hand if you've completed it. Okay, so we'll wait a few more minutes. I'm going to move back to here so those who Six is the highest, so up at the top, very low is one, and very high is six. Once you submit it, if you want to have the questions sent to you by email, you can put your email in. If you don't want that, you can just look at it right there on your screen. You'll have access to the link beyond, so if you want to go look at it later on, too, you can. Okay, raise your hand if you've, uh, if you've, if you're done. Only three? It's okay, so we need to wait a couple more minutes. go through and just answer so you can see what you should expect here. When you're done, you'll press this little arrow at the bottom. And it will give you a score on those top two, dispositions and technological literacy. And we'll, go, we'll be going through and doing the other ones in order as, as I teach you about each of the sections. If you want to have them sent to you, you can put your email in here and have, have them and the score sent to you. If you don't, you can just say continue without answering and this is what would be sent to you. Okay. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to share with, see, this is part of the taking a little bit of risk, right? I want you to share with your neighbor an area where you feel like you're strong in terms of dispositions and technical skills, and an area where you maybe need some work, OK? So, so go ahead and. Uh, I still see some people looking at screens, so maybe you're, are you still working on getting it scored? How many have completed it? Okay, so most of you have completed it. Okay, so, so turn to your neighbor and share something that you feel like, based on this survey, is a strength of yours and also something that you feel like you need to work on. Now, you, are, you guys are all professors and teachers, so I'm expecting you to interact with each other. You want your students to interact, right? Hassan, you need to come over and you can't get out of this. Okay, take about 30 more seconds, so if you haven't had a chance to share, sh uh, take turn to share. Stacy, you're not participating. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, if I can have your attention back up. So this is a starting place for you, right? Start thinking about what the dispositions are that you need to change or update in your life. And also start thinking about the, the technical skills that you need to acquire that will make you a more effective blended teacher, that will provide that foundation for these other pillars that I'm going to talk about today. So the first pillar that I'm going to talk about is online integration. This is the one that's most closely related to the design of your courses. The other three that I'm going to talk about have more to do with the teaching of your courses, but this one has a lot to do with the design of your courses. So um, this is the way two uh, important scholars in the field talk about this skill. Garrison says that it's the integration, the thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences with online learning experiences. Okay, So we can just combine the two, but what they're talking about is something that's really thoughtful, meaningful, uh, that, that, that you've reflected on, and you're, you're making decisions uh, because you think it's going to improve the teaching and learning for your students. Uh, Tony Picciano said that it's integrating online with traditional face-to-face -face in a planned, pedagogically valuable manner. Okay? So this online, this, inter, this skill of online integration, I think it was our first uh, commenter that talked about that important skill, being able to know how to, to blend these two pieces. So go ahead and go back to this link. This time I'm going to have you do it before I talk about the, the skills here. I gave you the definitions. So go back to this link. And this time you're going to just push the online integration. You're going to just check the online integration box. So this third box. There should be eight questions. So this one should go fast again, faster than the last one. answer those eight questions about online integration. So I just re I'll just kind of read some of these questions as you're going through. Evaluating the strengths and limitations of specific online activities. Strategically combining in-person activities uh, in ways that enable students to have ownership of their learning. Determining when it's best to use online assessments. That's going to be the, uh, the topic of all day tomorrow is how to do online assessments. OK, how many are done with this section? OK, so we're still working on it. Okay, raise your hand if you've done the, the questions. So we're still waiting for some. Okay. So in an ideal blended environment, if I were teaching this, I would have the students do this survey outside of class before coming. So that in the face-to-face -face class, we could do all the discussion about where they're at, right? We didn't have that option here today. So we're we're doing the next best thing. 
But I hope that you realize, I hope that you see that we can use technology to involve the class, right, in evaluating themselves and do thinking for themselves as opposed to just uh, listening to someone up front talk. So go ahead and raise your hand if, you, if you've completed this one. OK, great. So uh, what were some of the questions there? Were there any questions that you were surprised about? What, what was, an, uh, what was a qu of any of these questions, were there any of these that were, you were surprised about or that you felt like um, were uh, going to be challenging for you? You can tell I'm not asking good questions here. Looking for help for technical problems, I guess. OK. Huh? Okay, providing uh, procedure, clear procedures for transitioning between online and in-person activities. This is particularly important if you're using technology in the classroom, right? Uh, so good. What, what, did you have a particular question about that one? Uh, no, I just didn't, I, I didn't really think that I needed to establish a clear procedure. I just kind of do it by my instinct instead of <laughs> uh, having a clear procedure, which I think actually would, would be better. You'd have some sort of guidance then. But I think it's different in every situation then, wouldn't it be? Yeah. In, in blended learning in college settings, oftentimes the online portion is happening outside of class. And so you don't have a transition. But sometimes you're using the technology within the class, right? You're, you're having them uh, contribute to something within the class that gets posted up on the screen, right? Or something like that. Um, so you need to have, you, you need to be thinking about maybe procedures that, that uh, help students transition between paying attention to their laptop, paying attention to their computer, and paying attention to you as an instructor. Presentations, not up. This is the other. Any other questions that you had about this uh, particular set of? Skills. Were you raising your hand? Yeah. Oh, you, you were not. Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were waiting for the microphone. OK. So last time, we talked about models and there being a range of models, right? So this, this skill of being able to, uh, this online integration skill or competency really has to do with choosing the pedagogies within those models. So the most common that we see at the university level, we talked about this last time, so I'm not going to go into it a lot, are the flipped model, where you choose to do um, some activities in class, usually more application type activities, and then you have some content delivered outside of class, uh, usually uh, video content or more didactic lecture content outside of class. The replacement model, uh, in, in the flipped model, typically you're not reducing any face-to-face -face class time. In the replacement model, you're adjusting, you're, you're trading off some, you're reducing some face-to-face -face class sessions, and you're adding some online interaction, an online interaction section, session. So last time, this is just a, a uh, overcap of the, some of the things that we talked about last time. There's a link at the bottom that, where you can go to the workshop uh, materials from 
uh, March. But we talked about identifying outcomes. We talked about identifying act creating activities, both content-based activities and community-based activities. And then we talked about assessments and the role of creating online assessments to uh, help us assess whether we've achieved the outcomes. So some common mistakes that people make uh, in this skill set, the online integration skill set, are what we call course and a half syndrome. Who can tell me what course and a half syndrome is? Who have heard about this mistake? Yes, here's a hand. Let's pass the microphone. I think it has to do with the load. So you are doing more work in blended learning than the, you usually do in the traditional classes. Okay, yeah, so this is a mistake, right? This is something we want to avoid. And it does have to do with load. It's like we have a face-to-face -face class that we normally teach. And we say, oh, we want to try some online stuff. We want to try blending. So we add a bunch of online activities. Okay. Um, so you add a whole bunch of online activities, but you don't take away any of the face-to-face -face activities. You don't do any replacement. So this is a problem because basically what you're doing is you're adding another half a course to the course that the students are already taking, right? So what you really want to do in a blend is you want to choose what things you can do best online and what things you can do best face-to-face and do that. And if you're coming from a completely face-to-face -face course, there's going to be some things that you need to eliminate that you normally do face-to-face. -face. Otherwise, you're just adding on and adding on and adding on. Okay. Another major mistake that's often made is not connecting the online and the in-person instruction. So it's a pretty common mistake for teachers to say, we're going to do this stuff in class, and then I'm going to send the students off, and they're going to participate in a discussion board, or they're going to do something online. But then I never talk about it in class. I never mention it. I never take stuff from that online discussion board, bring it back, and say, you know, uh, Hassan made a really great comment in the online discussion, and bring it back into the face-to-face -face session. And so students start to think, <coughs> that the online portion doesn't matter, right? Because you never talk about it. All you do is the face-to-face -face portion. So these are some common mistakes. An important skill set with this online integration is the evaluation portion. It's knowing when you've uh, made good decisions about the technology that you're using in the class. And this is, uh, or using with the class, the online technologies. This is a framework that I like, that I'm just sharing with you. There's a lot of frameworks for evaluating. This one I like because it helps me to think about, uh, helps me to think about the decisions that I'm making. This is what we call the pick rat matrix. And you think of like a little rat that runs along. And it has two dimensions. One dimension has to do with what the student is doing with technology. And the other dimension has to do with how it's changing your practice as a teacher. So on this dimension, um, uh, is the technology that the student's using, is it a passive use of technology? Is it an interactive use of technology? Or is it a creative use of technology? And Along this dimension is your technology use, is it replacing? So is it just replacing something that you would normally do in the classroom, but not really uh, making an improvement at all? Or is it amplifying what you're able to do in the classroom, or is it really uh, transforming, changing in a big way what you're able to do in, a cl in the classroom? I'll go through a couple of examples of this. So passive, an example of passive is a student watching, 
listening or receiving. So just watching a video or listening to a lecture, that's a passive, students passively using technology. Interactive might be um, a small group discussion in class or small group discussion on a discussion board. Um, using uh, a literacy program or a computer program that uh, tests or quizzes the students. Oops. Creative use of technology is when the students are using the technology to generate or to create something. So when you have students using the technology to create a portfolio item or to create a presentation or to create a project, those are the best uses of technology, the creative uses. Replacing, an example of replacing is I have a worksheet that I normally use in class, and now all I'm doing is I've got that worksheet online. So this gives you some efficiency, but it doesn't improve the learning at all for the students. Amplifying is uh, an example of amplifying is that the teacher posts assignments and resources online for home access. So if students don't normally have access to something, this amplifies your ability to, you know, they can re-watch something or they can um, access it in a way that they weren't able to access it before. So that amplifies your ability as a teacher. Transforming, let me, I don't know why this is not going. Okay, so this is when the technology is allowing you to do something that was not possible or practical before. So the example that I provide about this is a virtual field trip. So uh, if you're, you're uh, teaching about, um, like in, in my case, maybe I'm teaching social studies, teaching about the government, it's, it would be impractical for me to take uh, a class, a whole class to Washington, D.C. to visit the Capitol building or visit things there. But I can take them on a virtual field trip. Or it might be impossible to take them to a science lab to uh, visit with a scientist in the lab. But I could bring the scientist to my classroom, right? So this is the technology is allowing something that was not, is not possible before. So I want to give you, uh, well, I'm going to give you a scenario to look at. But right here, um, having things in this bottom corner that are passive replacing is not necessarily bad, right? It's not bad to, you know, uh, convert a paper worksheet to a digital worksheet. But overall, we want to be moving our instruction this direction up towards the right-hand corner where we have students more actively using technology, interacting with it and uh, uh, creating with the technology. And uh, moving from something that's just replacing something that you already do in the classroom to uh, amplifying and transforming something that you do in the classroom. So I have this scenario. I hope Hassan doesn't mind this because I just picked this up from him yesterday. So. Hassan flips his classroom by capturing his video, his lectures on video, and putting it online for students to watch so that he can do application case discussions in class. Okay? Traditional flipped classroom scenario. This isn't all that Hassan does. He does a lot of other things too. But I, I wanted to pull this example out to, to share with you. I want you to turn to your neighbor and, and uh, talk with your neighbor, try and decide where you think this fits on the pick rat matrix. What is the student doing and what, how is it transforming his teaching, okay?
them if you want. Don't exclude him from <laughs> Okay, take about 30 more seconds. Okay, let's hear from a couple of a uh, couple of people. Where do you think that this example falls? Yes. Uh, in the middle, the center, IA. Okay, so you said... Interactive and amplifying. Okay, so explain why you think that it's, first of all, and, uh, yeah. over and, here, what is the student doing with the technology? Um, they are, it is a kind of application, it's beyond a passive, so there is something beyond just comprehension or getting something, you are working with something, so more interactive and going beyond the basic replacement because we have discussion. So without application and discussions, they go beyond the basic thing, although it didn't reach the top uh, goal, which is CT. So we thought it's an IA, uh, my partner and myself. Okay, <laughs> good. Anybody else come up with a different, there's not a right answer to this, by the way, uh, so. I think it's in the passive replacing because what he has done is he has converted his uh, classroom, which was a face-to-face, -face, into an, uh, uh, a lecture which is online, but the students are still passive because the discussion will uh, take place in, still in the class. So it's just replacing and it's passive. Okay. Any, I heard a different one down here somewhere. You guys want to share yours? Anybody else have a different? Oh, it, already, it was already shared, passive replacing or uh, the middle well, one? We thought, at first passive, we, th we thought at first passive replacing, but then if they're doing case discussions, um, application case discussions, uh, besides maybe if it's online, then it would be more interactive. Okay. So what, part of what I want you to think about with this matrix is there's not right or wrong answers. The purpose of this is to get you starting to think about how the students are using the technology and how it's changing your practice. Okay. So there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this. When I think about Hassan, the students using video, I think that's mostly in the passive realm, okay? But when I think about how it's transforming his practice, it's allowing him to do something in his class that he wasn't able to do before when he was lecturing in his class, right? So I probably, if I were doing it, I probably would have said it's passive, but then I would have pulled it over here either in the amplifying or if he was just doing a really bang up job maybe it's actually even transforming what he's doing, okay? I'm gonna add a little more to this scenario though because I heard Hassan talk a little more about what he does and there we go, okay. Actually, Hassan use, you inserts panopto questions into the course videos every few minutes as concept checks for the students as they watch the videos. How does this change how we think about the student use of uh, technology over on this side. So go ahead and talk with your neighbors a little bit about that. Okay. Let's have some volunteers from the back. No uh, hiding in the back rows, right? In the back, somebody from the back. Courage, growth mindset. 
This is your chance to increase your dispositions right now. Practice. Hand raise. Nobody? Okay. A brave. Right here we got. We've got one right here. Thank you. No, right here. In, right. Oh. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, IE, interactive and amplifying now. Okay. So why did you change it to interactive? Because of the questions now that the students have to answer while they are watching the video. Okay. So now, using this technology, this Panopto technology, the students can't just sit and consume the video, right? So it's not a passive activity anymore. Because as they're watching the video, they have to answer questions. They have to be in active learning mode, right? So his use of technology, adding this new technology to this flipped experience, is actually changing the experience for the students. So uh, I, I will add one more thing, because the main reason behind uh, incorporating questions within the videos. The students knew that I'm following who is watching what and, and when they skip the clips. So they started playing the clip and they go watch TV or eat or do anything else. So I said, okay, <laughs> then here are some questions in the middle just to make sure that they are going to go through it. Yeah, so you're turning an experience that they're viewing from the outset, they're saying this is going to be a passive learning experience, right? That's watching this video. And you're, you're telling them, I'm not going to let this be a passive experience. And also, it's actually providing something else. I mean, this might, you might say this is, turn it. Uh, you might say that this is actually amplifying or moving it into a transforming stage too because it's doing something that would be difficult to do otherwise, right? You're, you're, you're basically telling the students, I can watch how much you've done to watch this video. How many of us can do that when we assign a text reading, like in a textbook? It's difficult to do, right? We don't know how much they've read. We don't know how much they've watched, but the technologies are allowing us to have a different view into that now, right? Some of the digital textbooks will even let you see how much the, the students have read in the textbook. And let them see too, right? Okay, so I think that this is a valuable tool in thinking about how you use technology and how you're transforming your, your practice. The next, the next uh, competency, second pillar that I want to talk about is what we call data practices. So I'm going to have you go in and take the quiz, take the self-assessment. There we go. Let's go in and take the self-assessment on this one, see how you are, and then I'm going to talk about these skills. By the way, on your browser, you can just click on the URL and say reload, and it will just go right there. You don't have to type it in every time. Think about your own students in a class, right? They're in a class and you're asking them to do something. 70% of them are, 30% of them aren't. You wouldn't not do that, would you?
raise your hand if you're done, just so I get a sense. Okay, another minute or so. Okay, I'd like you to quickly turn to your neighbor and uh, share something in this set, this competency that you feel like you could develop, become stronger at. This, in my estimation, is one of the most important competencies uh, for a blended teacher. Were you guys able to do it? Did you have a, okay. Maybe you can turn around and share with this right behind you. Okay, take 30 more seconds and then we're going to move on. Okay, if I can have your attention back up here. Data practices has to do with your ability to uh, read and use data from dashboards and from the software that you're using to help make instructional decisions. And this is really important because almost every piece of software that, we, that you use is going to provide you some data that can help you improve your instruction if you know how to use it well. So um, this is, oh. So these are some of the ways, the most common ways of using data to improve instruction. First, you can use the data to inform student learning goals. Okay? You can also use the data to inform the activities that you're going to have for the students. You can use it to improve the course materials, and you can use it to improve the assessments that you have in the course. So um, this is the way that I, this is how I kind of remember simply what you do with data. I call it the AAA or the A cubed, right? You have to ask good questions of the data. So all of these programs are going to provide you, I'll show you some Blackboard screens here in just a minute. They're going to provide you with uh, a screen that shows data on the students or on your course or on your university. You need to know what questions to ask the data. And then you need to use that data to analyze, to answer the questions. And then the last one is really important. You need to use that data to act, right? Make a decision about what you're going to do about the data. So ask, analyze, act is the process. So I want to ask, what kinds of data do you use right now to support learning? Go ahead and talk with somebody near to you, and then I'm going to have some of you report back. What data do you use right now?
you guys wanna, or is that too uncomfortable? Okay, can you guys share with each other what data you use? Can you guys include her also? Could you come over and join with these? Okay, what is some of the data? If I could have your attention back, just raise your hand. Let's hear from, a, from some of you what data you use to help inform your, uh, your to help support your learning. Okay, Hassan, where's the microphone? There you go. Well, actually, I'm gonna share what I showed you uh, yesterday. If, if you have a Blackboard course, in the navigation bar to the left, you go all the way to the bottom and you'll find the link there called Evaluate. When you click that link, you're gonna find a lot of analytics data about your course. One of the reports, it shows the online student activities and the achieved grade in there. And it has four quadrants, it's color coded. If it's blue, then it's high, Online activities. I'm going to show. I'm going to show oh, a picture okay. of this. Oh, okay. And 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 high grade. So I look for any red color code in there. Red means either the student is not active online, or achieving low grade. And Here. it helped me a lot. Yes, exactly. It helped me a lot to just call students and say, well, you're not active online, and that is affecting your grade. So tell me what's the problem. I had a lady this semester, uh, she was achieving very high grades and she was not active online. And I said, well, tell me what your magic is. And she said, well, I read PDFs that you had before and it doesn't really you know, give me the chance to go online and, and, and get that. So I find this one very of the helpful. very powerful reports that can help me to take preemptive uh, and corrective decisions based on that data. Great. Somebody else, what's some data that you use to help support your learning? Yeah. Um, I actually, I'm using the data for the distribution of the students after the online exams. It helped me a lot uh, to give the students who are weak extra activities to improve their learning and to give them like uh, more chances to improve their learning. Because uh, I noticed that when I give them an online exam and uh, a written exam, uh, there is a big difference in marks. Um, so uh, basically I use this data to, to find out what is the problem, why they get this kind of low grades while they are using the online exams, but they are getting higher grades if they are taking it offline. So Great. it helped me a lot. That's good. Okay, maybe one more. Uh, somebody in the back. Back corner. Nobody? Nobody in the back, can I? Okay, I'm failing here. And here then. Do you ever feel like this as a teacher? Yeah. Right. People? Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, when we design exam questions and quizzes, usually we align them to the course learning outcomes. And if you look at the performance, you can know straight away whether the outcome is about to be achieved or is the students are weak at so you can actually do some corrective decisions. Excellent. Okay, so there's three different kinds of data that you can look at. I call this activity data, preference data, and performance data, okay? So many of you have been talking about performance data. That's the kind of data that you'd have in a grade book, right? I think I've got some examples here. Performance data might be grade book, or a dashboard for adaptive learning, or the scores from exams, national or state exams or something. 
activity data is data that tells you about what the, the activity of the student is in the course, like attendance, or like participation, or like LMS login data. can tell you if they're even coming in to the class. Or I found out that the, the Panopto allows you to actually go in and look at how much of a video students have watched, right? And so you, that's activity data. That's looking at what the activity of the students are. This is really important because when you're in a class teaching face to face, you're collecting data all the time, right? You're, you're watching, and if I see Hassan dozing off, I can go in proximity to him and help him to, you know, uh, start to engage more in the class, right? Or like in, in this class, when if I knew you better, I would be able to interact even better with you. But if I see that there's someone who's not interacting, I can come closer and say, would you like to connect with this person? Would you do this, right? And that is because I am collecting data in the face-to-face -face setting. Once you go in the online setting, you're kind of blind to that, right? You can't, you can't see with your eyes how the students are engaging with the class. And so you need to use tools like this to be able to see what kind of activity they're having. And that will help you solve problems. So here's some examples. I, I, I'm going to show you a couple of examples from Blackboard. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples from a Khan Academy. Uh, so this is Khan Academy. It shows all of these units that they did in the circle. And the, the width of the block shows how much time. So you can see here that in this particular block that it's pointing to, um, for this skill set, they worked on five problems. They got one correct without a hint, and it took them about five minutes. Okay? So you can see that this is both activity data and performance data mixed up. Here's another one that shows here's total minutes spent. Blue is video minutes. Green is skill minutes, so working on problems. And so you can see that this particular student was spending a little time on video this first uh, uh, day and a lot of time working on the skills, and then that flip-flopped here. Here's another one. If you look here, up here, it's showing the amount of time. It's hard to see. There's a little clock. But the amount of time that they spent, and these are units that they passed off. They passed off zero units right, on that. Um, down here, you can see how many questions they got right and how, many time, how much time they spent on each of them. So you can see it's a mix of performance data and activity data. Let's look at some Blackboard screens. So this is a Blackboard screen. This uh, course accesses, is that activity data or is that performance data? If you think it's activity data, raise your hand. Okay. If you think it's performance data, raise your hand. If you're asleep in this class, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, it's activity data. Yeah, uh, time in course is also activity data. Inter interactions is also activity data. Submissions is also activity data. And grade, total score, that would be performance data. Okay. Here's the screen that Hassan was telling you about um, that mixes activity and performance data. This is another one from Blackboard that's a rubric that tells you um, these are the scores on a rubric, points from 0 to 5. And this is telling you for each of these problems that use this rubric what 
percentage of the students scored in those different rubric categories. So you can start to see, well, this on this one, 83% scored a five, right? On this one, 100% scored a four. So you can start to see either where students are having problems or where you're having challenges with your rubric. Here's another one that tries to map, this is from Blackboard, maps, maps course accesses to grades in a scatter plot. So you can start to see that as students use the system more, their grades typically go up. And um, Ruth, on this one, are you able to actually click the buttons and drill down? So you could come to a student that's like way down here. You could actually click on the dot and drill into that student to see what, you know, what challenges that student might be having. Here's another one. Maybe I'll just, uh, this is another Blackboard one, but it, it's looking at time spent in the system compared to the class average. So being able to read and use data is important to uh, being a, a good blended teacher. Um, Mastery-based learning is something that's used a lot in blended teaching. So this, this shows uh, time-based progression, which is what we use in college most of the time, right? We say we're going to give you four weeks till the midterm exam or six weeks till the midterm exam. You take the exam, you're going to be a 60% or you're going to be an 80% and then we're going to move on to the next thing. And that's really great for sorting students, but it's not the best approach for learning, right? A better approach for learning is is giving students some flexibility in time. And we haven't figured out how to do this very well in a college setting because we really value distributing the students. But this is an important thing to think about because blended learning allows us to think about mastery-based learning in a, a, a more practical way. Here's some of the kinds of dashboards that exist for people who are doing mastery-based learning. Typically what happens in these dashboards is red means students are really struggling. They need remediation. Yellow means that they're near mastery, so they're getting close. And green means that they've achieved it, achieved mastery. So you can quickly look at a dashboard and see which students are struggling on which concepts and then provide additional support and help to those students, either in the face-to-face -face setting or with uh, additional resources. Uh, relate, I, I want to share, so I, I, want, I want you to answer this question. If I set a mastery threshold, meaning to achieve mastery, they have to get 85%, and I'm looking at this grade book and I'm looking at the exam, how many of these students would you say mastered the content? looking at this grade book? All of them. OK. I heard somebody say all of them. I want to point out this is a, a very interesting thing. So just by looking at the final grade, you might say every student in this class achieved mastery. Now what happens is when we have an exam, we may have three items on the exam that are, that are uh, measuring this uh, student learning outcome. We might have, you know, uh, another set of items that are measuring this learning outcome, another set of items that are measuring this learning outcome, and another set of items that are measuring this last learning outcome. So look at what happens when we spread this out by learning outcome as opposed to just the final grade. So Every student here got 85% or higher on the final grade. But if we look at it, if we disaggregate it by learning outcome, what we see is that there was only one student in the class, student six, who got 85% on all of the learning outcomes. Why is this important?
Can you see why? Yeah, because we can be misinterpreting the data. We can be saying, we think the students are doing really great, but every student has some holes in their understanding on these different learning outcomes that is going to make the next step for them challenging, especially if the next step that there's prerequisite knowledge here, especially in air in science. You know, chem think about math concepts, chemistry concepts. You need to move on to this next thing. You missed this con. You didn't understand this concept. Okay. So there's also data in these systems that allow you to to check your tests, so you can see. You know, is, are the items functioning well? A have I written good tests? And I'm going to skip most of those because I think it's pre that's pretty self-explanatory and we're running out of time. So the, the third pillar is personalization. So personalization has to do with trying to uh, help students in an individual way. I'm going to let you do this later on your own because we don't have much time left. But I would encourage you to go in and test yourself on personalization. This is typically one that university faculty are fairly weak on. And I'm going to show this video from Educause. So um, personalization is a little bit different from what we would call uh, customization. Because personalization, by definition, gives students some control over one of these five things. Their goals, the time, place, pace, or path of their learning. So uh, some control it gives some students control over what outcomes to focus on, or when the instruction takes place, or where and with whom instruction takes place, or how quickly they progress through, or how a student progresses through the path that they take through the learning activities. So um, it's important to note that students don't always know what's best for themselves. And I know you as instructors know that. So there's a give and take here when we try and personalize. We want to give them 
paths that are going to be helpful, uh, but let them also use their agency in choosing the path, the pace, or various of these. Um, I have some interesting videos on these, but I'm going to let you watch the, the videos later so we can get to the last skill, the last competency. This is a video about a math emporium. So it's a way of making, uh, allowing students to kind of go at their own pace in the emporium using math software that helps and gives them feedback. But there's teachers that are in the emporium that come and give guidance to the students as they need help and as they get stuck. So that's a way of personalizing. And uh, there's an adaptive software. So one way that you can do uh, personalization is through what we call playlists. A playlist, an audio playlist, right, is you just a list of songs. And you can choose the order, or you can say to randomly go through. A learning or a digital playlist is when you have a list of activities. And you can choose different ways to let the students go through those activities. So uh, they can complete them in a specified order. They can do an order that's determined by a pre-assessment. They can choose the order of completion. The students can themselves. Or sometimes you say, these ones are required and these ones are optional. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, if you put together a playlist of activities, that you can mix that up to allow students some personalization in how they go through the activities. And these are just some simple ways of doing it. So in this case, they, the teacher is saying you have this choice of this column, this choice of this column, or this choice of this column. So it's giving students some choice of the path that they take through the content. The last skill is a pretty common skill. It's that of online interaction. So when I think about blended learning, uh, or online learning, or traditional learning, I think about the interaction in these quadrants. On the top, we have technology-mediated interaction. So, uh, and, and non-technology-mediated interaction. And then the columns, we have interaction with humans, and we have interaction with content uh, or materials. And so this area down here, I think I'll, sh oops. This area down here, the bottom, is what's traditionally done in a, a traditional classroom. We have physical materials, you know, lab equipment. We're face to face with students. These areas up here are what typically happen online. And the thing about a blended course is it has, you have to have skills to be able to do interaction in all of these spaces. So we're particularly going to talk about the learner-human interaction in the digital space. So right now, there's lots and lots of opportunities for digital interaction in the online space. In fact, this is some uh, area that's growing very, very rapidly. Um, I just want you to think for a minute about the possibilities that you've experienced just in your personal lives. What, what ways do you use technology to communicate with people? Hassan. And, and each group works on what I call term case. And uh, most of them, they travel from different Emirates uh, here in the country. And uh, Collaborate Ultra helped me to digitally communicate with them as a group. And I can see all of them. And I can even record that, which couldn't happen in face-to-face -face office hours. So most of the group meetings happened that way. Great. Other, were you raising? We, we have a hand right here, the red. Thank you. Um, 
uh, I also do use the Blackboard Collaborative Ultra. Uh, I have a PhD student now who is in from Kuwait, and sometimes he has some transportation problem. So I allow him to stay in his country, and we can synchronize the in-classroom uh, lecture together. And I can record the session, which he can use it later. Okay, great. So. Um, there are lots of changes happening in this space. It used to be that we could only communicate using text, very low fidelity. But now there's lots of tools that allow you to communicate basically any way you want, high fidelity or low fidelity. So these are a couple of uh, tools that have changed my life recently, Marco Polo and Zoom. Zoom is a synchronous video tool that I use in my online courses. Marco Polo is an asynchronous video tool. So that means you don't have to both be on at once, right? You record a little video clip, somebody watches it, they record a little video clip back to you. So these are really changing how um, instruction is happening because Imagine you're a math teacher, and you're faced with the issue of somebody asks you a question online, and now how are you going to communicate back to them the process of solving this math problem or the process of solving this chemistry problem? Typing it out is usually not practical. But you could have a video. You could, if you video yourself solving the problem, then that the students can see the process of you going through that uh, problem solving process. So, uh, skip lots. Language learning, I know we have some people in here who are doing language learning. This is having a big impact on language learning right now because it used to be that we just have learner content interactions in the digital space, and then we have our human interactions in the face-to-face -face space. But there's tools now, like, I don't, how many of you have heard of the VIP Kid? Have you heard of VIP Kid? Oh, just one, wow, okay. Well, there are hundreds of thousands of students in China learning English through VIP Kid. They have a personal tutor that's usually a mom or an ex-teacher at home who meets with them for a half an hour a day uh, and over live video tutors them in English, does activities with them, speaks with them in English, right? BYU-Idaho had a program like this they call the Speaking Partners, where they, where they partner somebody who's trying to learn English with somebody who um, doesn't know, or someone who's trying to learn English with someone who's a native speaker, and they get together and talk around a particular topic. So it's changing a lot how we think about learning. So I encourage you to think about online interaction and think beyond text interaction, because we're going to look back in five years and we're going to say we were in the we were in the Stone Age, always communicating. With our, with with text. Finally, oh, um, yeah. So, this these are the last set of slides. There's these dimensions of interaction: space, where you're at, time, asynchronous versus synchronous, and fidelity. So, how much you see of the person, how much uh, kind of emotion you can see in the communication with the person. So this is where we are in a traditional course. Oops. We have low flexibility in space, because we all have to be together. We have low flexibility in time, because we're all together. But we have a high fidelity, because we're together, right? We can smell each other and hear each other and, I mean, everything, right? If you're on the front row, you might get spit on and feel someone, you know. So this is a traditional 
historically traditional text-based online course. Can you see how it's very different experience for the students? It increases the flexibility for the students here, but the fidelity goes way, way down. This is what's happening once we bring in and think about asynchronous video. We maintain the flexibility that students want and need, but we're not way out here in terms of the uh, fidelity. So these are the skill sets. Technology skills, dispositions as a foundation. Uh, online integration, data practices, personalization, and online interaction as four core pillars of skills that you need to develop to be a uh, more successful blended teacher. And um, we're in the process of creating some free materials uh, around the research that we're doing with this. Right now, our, the first book that we have, if you go to EdTech Books, by the way, the Pick Rat Matrix, you can also get some videos and materials there from EdTech Books. It's not this book, but everything at EdTech Books is a free OER resource, open educational resource. So this book will be free um, when it comes out. This is the K-12 blended, uh, it will have examples of K-12 blended in it. And then soon after that, we'll have a higher ed version. So you can look for the higher ed version to come out later with the same skill sets, the same competencies, but a different set of examples that are higher ed oriented. So Hassan, I'm finishing a minute early. Thank you. Questions about all of this? Align the, the four pillars you have with the professional development portfolio that we provide on campus here because I think after after this talk, the, the faculty professional development should take a different route. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the competencies of how to to become a blended or online instructor. Did that happen in any other institution? So we're, we're pretty early in the stages. So this instrument that you looked at, we're in the process of validating it right now. So uh, I mean, you're getting the cutting edge stuff right now of what we're doing. The, you're right. The ideal is we know that faculty have limited time and so putting faculty through a professional development program that covers everything, some of which they already have the skills for, is not a very efficient use of time. But if we can somehow identify what the core skills are that faculty need and do some kind of pre-assessment with them, then we can say, oh, Hassan, I see that an area that would be great for you to develop your skills around are data practices. And here is going to be a workshop that's going to talk about the data practices with our LMS, the, you know, the Blackboard LMS, so that you can come and sharpen your skills in how to use data that you'll, you'll have from your students. So I think it's a great idea. That's, that's the intent, is to create something that can be customized or personalized to the needs of individual faculty. instrument would be a good idea before we develop the, the, the faculty professional development. So, so that would, would point to what's needed by our teaching community? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the skills that we talked about here was personalizing. Wouldn't it be hypocritical for us to say, we want you to personalize for your students, but when we provide faculty professional development for you, we're going to just provide, we're, we're going to give you we're going to give you everything regardless of what you need, right? And so the idea behind this is to have some kind of assessment that helps faculty um, under, 
understand where their strengths and their limitations are in terms of their skill set, and then we can build some personalized options for them, invite them to specific, uh, you know, specific workshops or specific sessions that will help them develop the skills that they need. So, any other questions? Thanks so much for that. That was so interesting. Um, the instrument is fantastic, and I was really curious about the data practices side because it struck me that a lot of the questions around the data practices were sort of predicated on institutional availability of things like dashboards. Are you aware of any institutional readiness surveys that, it, that would lend itself to, to that kind of thing? Because things like dashboards, some, some institutions, including mine, uh, I'm, I'm not from UAU, would would we would need these things. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that is really insightful. Um, this instrument that we've created, of course, is generic, right? It's trying to get at the, gener the, the specific skill, but it's, n it's uh, tool independent. And certainly when you do the training and the skill at your school, you're gonna have to, it's gonna have to be tool specific yeah. training because you don't learn generically how to read a data dashboard. You want the data dashboard for the LMS that you have. And every institution is going to have, you know, specific L uh, an LMS that's going to have data for them. Well, and I wonder, is there an answer to that question? Like, I have no experience. So that it's, if, if, you're, if you have one to six, is it one? Oh, I see what <laughs> you're saying. No, I was just, I just as you were uh, that's speaking, a good, I was thinking that's that. That's a good question. I, I think, generally, I think probably the data practices skill transfers, I mean, uh, transfers across tools. If you have experience with one tool, um, it doesn't mean that you're, you'll automatically know how to do it in the other tool, but you'll know what the possibility is and be looking for those things in another tool. That, that, that would be a good research question, though. I don't know. That's great. Okay, I think last question over here. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm Rasha Shaya from the Saudi Electronic University. Um, our courses at the university are completely blended. So uh, this was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, when you talked about um, personalizing the uh, courses, that was a challenge that we had before, um, especially in some courses where the students need uh, hands-on uh, materials. Uh, I'll give you an example of some translation uh, courses where we have in our department. Uh, students are supposed to attend some conferences to do the uh, conference uh, interpretations. Uh, and we were planning to take them to the field to some conferences to translate. And we tried to personalize this we're not able to take actually the students. Some of them are in remote places. So we've, we did like um, uh, uh, virtual conferences. They attended virtual conferences. And the uh, personalization of this uh, in our courses was successful. Mm. So um, yes. It, That's really it, great. It helps I us a, a lot. I would love, send me some examples. I'd love to see that. I think sure. the personalization, honestly, is the, the area that's weakest in higher ed, that we know the least about how to do. They're trying, there's a lot of hype around this. There's a lot of people trying to figure out how to do it, but it's, it's very difficult. Right now, the way that it's mostly done is students work online and the personalization is not happening online. The personalization is happening in the face-to-face -face environment. So the online helps to identify where the students need help. And then the teacher in the face-to-face -face environment is providing um, small group or individual uh, tutoring and help for those students. So that's kind of, that's kind of the main way that it's happening right now, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be that way. Yes, we do it both in face-to-face -face and in virtual classes. So uh, videos, uh, 
um, uh, translating some conferences are there in the virtual classes. This, the virtual class, in the virtual class, we have videos of conferences and the students record their um, interpretation of the uh, ver uh, conferences. So it doesn't matter if it's a face-to-face -face or a virtual class. We can do the, the same in both. Thank you.